Hello everyone, it's Oscar at Virtual Factual here and today I'm letting myself be inspired by negative emotions because I'm getting really, really tired of the fact that there's now a bunch of dudes in the internet who keep constantly banging on about the fact that the spear is a superior weapon over the sword without necessarily understanding what that sentence actually means. There's tons of opinions about this subject uh, and thankfully there's still quite a lot of them that are well informed and balanced and take context into account. A lot of fellow YouTubers have made some good videos about the subject, but unfortunately the whole idea that the spear is better than the sword has now reached the mainstream and it's kind of being very much misunderstood at the moment. So I'm not calling anyone out in particular, but I do think that the short-sightedness on display in some of these memes is just getting really out of hand. And I think that we need to address this. I've had people tell me that in medieval times the spear was the king of the battlefield and that me and other HEMA people are lying to the general public by primarily studying and fencing with swords. <sighs> One of the things I like to think I do kind of well is combined theory and practice. So what I'd like to do today is dive a little bit deeper than usual and use both contexts to give a little bit of meaning to this whole debate of spear versus sword and of course do a couple of practical experiments and by that try and answer the age-old question which is better spear or the sword just a warning up front though if you're one of the 3,000 something people that would publicly admit to watching these videos because you're subscribed to the channel then you already know that i like to make simple things very complicated by using the word context a bunch of times for those of you who are new here and who thought it would just be fun to hear a handlebar mustachioed nerd talk about swords, well, you've come to the right place. But also, when I talk about subjects, I do try and answer a bunch of questions, but invariably I'll end up raising quite a few questions more. And before you know it, you find yourself that you might have to go and open some books to get your answers about historical combat instead of liking some memes. If that sounds like something you already do or want to do, then I think you will enjoy this video. Don't say I didn't warn you though. So, you're still here. Good. Let's get started then. The first thing we need to realize about the question whether the sword or the spear is better is that it is a stupid question. Better at what exactly? Usually when people are discussing this topic, they're discussing what I like to call the combat effectiveness of a weapon. So how well it does in a particular fighting situation. And what I usually mean by that is just a straight up one versus one with one person with a sword and the other with a spear. Now, to leave nothing to chance today, I decided to recreate this particular one versus one setup by having one fencer with a sword and the other with a spear. All targets are valid and uh, any hit ends the exchange. And this went about as well as you'd expect. So that's it. Spears better. Video's over. Go home, everyone. You're not that easily fooled then. Good. Indeed, there is something more to this. Despite the spear being clearly uh, superior in combat effectiveness in this particular experiment and all the other experiments like this that I know of that have been conducted by other people, historically speaking, people never stopped producing, uh, carrying and fighting with swords up until the 20th century. There's something going on here, and we need to contextualize it. Now, when people discuss this topic, uh, it's often in very vague and broad terms, like in Europe or during the Middle Ages. And that's a little bit too broad to be able to say anything really sensible about it. So for the rest of this video, I'm mostly going to be focusing on the late Middle Ages and 16th century. And also, I'm going to be focusing on southern German lands, uh, Austria, the Low Countries, mostly because we have a lot of sources from there, and I know quite a fair bit about those sources. Another thing to keep in mind is that people often use the word spears when they're actually talking about pole arms. Now, historically speaking, uh, pole arms, even different flavors of spears, tended to have different lengths, different head types, different functions in combat situations. Although for this discussion it kind of works to lump all of these variations together, it's good to keep in mind that by the late Middle Ages and early 16th century, absolutely nobody is sending a bunch of peasants out into the field with just a bunch of these boring old spears anymore. 
The infantry pole arm of choice was generally a pike, which is quite a bit longer, or something along the lines of a halberd, billhook, or vulge, or any of the other countless variations, which I'm not going to enumerate because that will take 20 minutes. You know, the kind that has a lot of different nasties towards the tip, therefore is a bit more top heavy and very choppy. That said, this is a topic of its own, worthy of its own video, so let's cut this tangent short for now. Let's begin today by looking at the civilian context and by examining why people generally didn't carry spears for self-defense. First reason is of course the law. Pole arms were generally considered to be weapons of war, so walking around with them in peacetime was prohibited unless you were performing your duty as member of the city watch. After all, if you arm yourself up as if for war, you're pretty much letting everyone around you know that your intentions are not peaceful. Breaking this law was generally punished quite severely, especially when it was done within the city bounds. And the countryside, the rules and regulations might have been a bit more lax, and of course it was policed way less, but even there, illegally being armed for war would arouse a lot of suspicion and you'd probably have to face some sort of consequence. Now, in cities in the Low Countries, carrying even swords openly in the cities was forbidden, so all people had was certain, up to certain lengths of daggers. But in cities in what's now Germany, uh, the open carry of swords was generally allowed, usually with a maximum length and sometimes even with no further restrictions than that they were not to be drawn except in self-defense. Even if pole arms were allowed to be openly carried in the city, I still think that a lot of these citizens would still prefer to carry a trusty sword or a long knife as their sidearm. I mean, after all, staves were allowed as long as they didn't have any nasty bits in them. And so if the superior reach of a pole arm is any sort of consideration here, why not carry a staff around? And I think practicality comes into play here. I can say from experience that carrying a pole arm around with you all day gets annoying really, really fast. It's super awkward when trying to enter a building and the more so when you need to open a door. If you need to do anything with more than one hand, you're going to have to put the spear down. And if you're anything like me, there's a pretty serious chance you're going to forget it somewhere. And finally, the rather nasty pointy nature of spears and other pole arms means that it's probably a good idea to have some sort of a sheath over it to prevent accidental stabbings. And although I haven't actually tried that yet, I can imagine that if you get attacked while carrying a spear um, and you need to then remove the sheath that's all the way up on a spear or other type of pole arm tip, you're not really going to have a good time. In conclusion, the scenario that we looked at previously with the spear versus the sword and unarmed fighters would generally not really occur that often, outside of when the social order really breaks down. And in that case, any self-respecting citizen of a medieval city would rush to arm and armor up and join their neighborhood unit of the city watch. If you found yourself without armor, with a sword, against a spear, you just fucked up massively and you just brought a self-defense weapon to what's for all intents and purposes a war zone. Speaking of war zones, what about a military context? A lot of the aforementioned problems with pole arms don't exist there, right? So if you're marching to war uh, as part of the contingent of city militia or a Haufen of Landsknechte and you're carrying a pole arm crossbow or a gun, you're not really breaking any laws there. And although none of these weapons are any less difficult to carry around, you are likely going to have way less to do that's not like military duties and at the same time Quite often you'd have carts or barges carrying your heavy equipment for you, so that is less of a consideration as well. But, but still, all of the people in historical images that are carrying pole arms, battle swords, guns and other primary weapons still carry the sword as a sidearm. So what's going on there? This primary weapon is generally speaking the weapon with the highest combat effectiveness. It's the weapon that allows a soldier to fulfill a certain role in the battlefield, such as being part of a pike formation guarding the Hauptmann and the banner with a greatsword, shooting at anyone on the evil team or anything else really. These are generally weapons that do a certain job really, really well, but aren't particularly versatile. And this is where the sidearms come in. Because these sidearms are generally speaking swords in the late Middle Ages. I know, it, it's nowadays fashionable to say that swords were super rare and very few people could afford them, but this is pretty much only true for the early Middle Ages. In the late Middle Ages and early 16th century, if anyone was going to be on a battlefield and had any business being there, they would have had at least somewhat decent stuff. Swords weren't that expensive anymore, thanks to economy of scale, the availability of good iron ore, and a very circular economy that often involved rehilting much older blades. Most middle class citizens would have had no problems buying not only a basic set of armor and a primary weapon, 
but also a good sword or long knife as a sidearm. But what about peasants being pressed into service? Well, this didn't happen that much anymore, to be frank. While feudal obligations in most places did allow lords to bring a retinue from among serfs when going to war, the fact that they weren't very motivated, poorly equipped, and couldn't be asked to serve for more than a certain number of days each year, about 40 seems to be a common number, means that such forces were more of a liability than anything else, especially in the face of the ever-continuing professionalization of the business of war that was taking place since the 14th century and was continuing ever since. The Burgundian duke Philip the Good tried to take Calais in the 1430s with a force largely consisting of city militia from Bruges and other cities, and it ended in a disaster. Most of the army just went home when their time was up. And these were relatively well of townsfolk with the best equipment their money could buy. The battles of Bannockburn and Kortrijk in the early 13th century did show that polearm and crossbow armed militias could be a force to be reckoned with. But when asked to perform on par with professionals, they would often just fall short miserably. And for nationalistic reasons, it's always the successful battles that get mentioned here, but no one ever seems to remember the other battles where they really didn't perform all too well. So, tangent over. Sidearms, generally speaking, are swords or long knives. And they're pretty much meant to be a versatile backup for when the primary weapon isn't working as intended anymore. You could, for instance, be fighting indoors, which is not great for polearms. E your weapon could have broken or run out of ammo. And in all these situations, a sword is a very good backup because it is versatile enough to work in all these different situations. Maybe it won't be the optimal choice in all of these situations, but it is versatile enough. And as a foot soldier, you generally don't get to pick the less than optimal situations that you get put in. So having versatility is a great attribute for a weapon here. I think this is a pretty good explanation of why late medieval soldiers would not just be carrying their pole arms or other primary weapons, but a sword as a sidearm as well. But there's another reason why having a sword with you in an infantry melee could be a really nice thing, and that is armor. Recently, Matt Easton at Scholar Gladiatoria did a really good video about his experiences at the Battle of Tewkesbury reenactment, where he was fighting as an armored man at arms uh, on foot in the retinue of the soon to be King of England. And during that reenactment battle, he found that when he wasn't fighting with his pole arm but with his sword, he could very easily tank all the hits because he was wearing full armor, and at the same time, uh, he had a lot of versatility from his sword. Interestingly, when I was watching that video, a few days prior to that, I had already recorded a couple of bouts with a very similar setup, and the results were also quite similar. And it, he's very much right about it. Armor changes everything. The idea was that I would put on my Lance Connect infantry armor with a breastplate, helmet, and arm protection. It's pretty representative of the levels of protection afforded by infantry armor of the late Middle Ages and early 16th century. I might look a bit silly in a sparring clip, but for ease of use I was wearing just the shirt, pants, doublet and the armor here. With modern socks and shoes, because easier to put on and the leather shoes on the gym floor is just horrible. And of course a fencing mask for safety. We were sparring with the armor as worn, meaning that only attacks that are solid and land on an unarmored surface end in exchange. For hits to the face, we counted the front of the mask mesh, as we've already established that the helmet covers the rest of the head quite well. For my sparring partners, we assumed they would be similarly armored, but we kind of just guesstimated the coverage since they have only HEMA sparring gear. The full bouts will come in a later video, since this one is already quite long, but the results were actually pretty surprising. I expected armor to make it a bit easier for the swordsman to win, but the extent to which a fencer with a sword can just use the armor, even very light armor like I'm wearing here, just tank hits and close in really surprised me. Hitting an opponent's limbs and head with a spear proved surprisingly hard, and with a breastplate, center mass thrusts really don't work anymore. Of course, the swordsman was never fully safe from being hit, but the ability to tank some hits really buys you the time you need to close in and gain the upper hand. Now, this is just sword and an admittedly somewhat sad spear, and there's a ton of other types of pole arms like pikes and halberds, and it would be really cool to do some sparring experiments to see how armor changes fighting those weapons as well. For now, I didn't really have the time and ability to do that though, but in the future, I'd definitely like to get back to that. So let me know if you'd be interested. <sighs> Who am I kidding? That stuff is freaking cool. I'm gonna be doing it anyway, but just let me know what you like to see it regardless. I think it's about time to knock this one particular video on the head though. I've been rambling on about swords and spears for more than long enough now. And if you're one of those legends that are still watching, you've probably gotten a sense that I won't really be answering the question whether the sword or the spear is better because 
the question still remains better at what. If it's purely combat effectiveness, yes, the spear will beat the sword. Uh, any polearm will be any sword, really. But there's other factors in play here. Practicability, uh, legal considerations, and of course, the fact that you have a spear with you in a war zone doesn't mean that you don't want to have a sword with you as well. Now, although most people have already buggered off because this video is, of course, longer than your average TikTok, I really appreciate that you are still watching. So having said all that, I still like to talk a bit about my patrons because making long videos like this is only possible because of their support. If you think the world needs more videos like this, why don't you go and have a look there as well? But if you want to support the channel in another way, of course, leaving a like and subscribing will also go a really long way. I personally found this topic really interesting to dive into. The Sparring Into experiment had some really interesting results. I was really surprised that how well even lighter infantry armor can still tank hits, allowing you to really even the playing field quite severely. And yeah, I'm, I'm very curious about your thoughts. Did you ever do a similar experiment and what was the result there? Did it confirm my suspicion or, or say something else completely? You know where the comment section is and I'm looking forward to your thoughts. And with that, I say, okay, do we?